tell you a story about how my mother got mugged once because she's amazing. I think my mother is the most courageous woman on the planet. And I remember one time she got mugged by these two, these two guys on a motorcycle. So she was going to a friend's house and this motorcyclist came up and they grabbed her bag, but she took her bag and she threw it into her, her friend's house. But this guy climbed over the gate to get the bag and he took the, he took the bag. Wow, that guy was really, really scary. But you know what my mom did? My mom actually scolded him. Hey, you, give me back my ID card. <laughs> she was, and, he, and he actually gave it back to her. And that's so amazing. I think I, I, I would just say, oh, please, please take, take my money. Don't, don't disturb. She was so courageous. And that's actually what we're going to see today. Because today we're going to see Jesus dying on the cross. You know, people have literally killed Jesus. They've done everything they can to take everything from Jesus, including his life. But the amazing thing is, at the end of his life, he gives us salvation. He gives us eternal life. And we're going to see two things from today's passage. We're going to see takers and givers. We're going to see people who try to take and take and take, even steal from God. But in response, instead, God should be judging all the thieves, all the takers. God actually gives us eternal life. And that's an amazing thing. Well, let me pray, and then I'll read that passage. Yeah, let me pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see how sometimes we take things that do not belong to us and forgive us for those sins. But help us also to see how you give us the most wonderful thing that we all need, that we all need to receive, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read from John chapter 19. And it's a funny place. It's right in the middle of verse 16. So it's really weird. If you can't find it, that's okay. I'll read, read it for you and you can just listen in. But if you have a Bible, it's a lot better. So this is John chapter 19 and verse 16. And it begins like this. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side of Jesus and Jesus in the middle. Now look here. I'll stop there. You know, if, if I drew a picture of what we just read, you know, it's what you get on Easter cards. You know, there's this hill and Jesus carries his cross up and they crucify him in the middle of two other people. And even tells us the name of this hill is called Golgotha, which means skull. And actually in English, have you ever been to a church called Calvary Church? Or sometimes you see movies with the word Calvary. That's the word skull. So next time you see Calvary Church, you think a church with lots of skulls. (laughs) It sounds so ominous. But it's talking about those final moments when Jesus will die on this hill between two other criminals on the cross. And the reason I say this is because if this is all we read, that's it. We can go straight to the resurrection. But actually, this is just an introduction. Now, get this. The the Bible is just introducing the idea of Jesus' death by painting this picture of the cross. Meaning, you need to ask, what else is it that we need to know? Jesus died on the cross, and he rose from dead. But no, the Bible actually wants us to tell us why Jesus is on the cross. What is actually happening? on the cross. So let's continue on. Verse 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened on the cross. Imagine this sign on top of Jesus. And this sign reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now when it says this sign, King of the Jews, I want you to think of King of, I don't know, of Nick. (laughs) King of Newton. King of Joseph, king of the Chinese church, meaning king of a particular group of people. And he's kind of say, how would you feel if, the, uh, if Pilate pointed to this person and said, he's your king? How would you feel? It tells us how these people feel in verse 20. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And here's their reaction, verse 21 the chief priests of the Jews protested. They said, no way, you know, do not write king of the Jews. This man that this man claimed to be king of the Jews and Pilate said, nope, 
what I've written, I've written. So what Pilate has done, he's written this, this sign saying, King of the Jews, and, he, and all the Jews saying, no, we do not want this sort of king. Now, you know, I can imagine over the next year, we're going to be looking for a new pastor. And isn't it, you know, when you have a new pastor, you look for recommendations. You know, you have CVs, maybe Pastor Kwa will recommend, this person is very good. He preaches very well. Maybe another pastor says, oh, this person is such a loving person. You think, oh, wow, very good, very loving, very loving. And then you, maybe one day you get a piece of paper. This person is the most horrible, most useless, most, we hate him. Please don't hire this guy. And you go, okay, perfect. We're going to get this guy. This guy must be our pastor. But you see, in God's eyes, this is the king the one whom no one else wants, this person whom they hate, this kind of, Jesus to this person looks like a loser. God says, that's your king. And you see here, religious people, people who are in church, the chief priests, people who lead the church, going, we have standards, and Jesus does not meet that standard. And Pilate, who is not a Christian, Pilate who doesn't go to church, saying, oh, I don't care, he's your king. He's kind of like non-Christians where they make fun of Christians. Say, ha, 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 it's so embarrassing. It's like, you know, when British people say to the US, to the US friends, ha, 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 your president is Trump. <laughs> and say, I'm, I'm, we have Boris, but, I'm, but you guys have Trump. It's like, it's like, oh, you guys have it worse. You see, they're both making fun of each other because both of them are rejecting Jesus. Why? Let's carry on because the soldiers tell us why. Verse 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, not to do laundry, they stole his clothes, in other words, and they divided them into four shares, one for each one of them, with the undergarment remaining. Now, this is so strange, right? I mean, the soldiers, you know, the boss told them, kill Jesus. So they're just doing their job. Okay, we killed Jesus. We hung him on the cross. But then there's a lot of verses telling us how they took his clothes, and then one for you, one for you. There are four, and then, okay, each one take one, each one take one. But then, oh, there's one left, one piece left. How do we decide? And they said, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll play a game of poker, or we'll play a game of cards, or we'll roll a dice, you'll gamble for it. It says there, you know, it describes this garment. This garment um, uh, was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Verse 24, don't tear it. Let's decide by lot, or by gambling, or by dice. Who will get this? By the way, did you know that Jesus was crucified naked on the cross? That's, that, that's why they took all his clothes. You see, the cross was meant to be a public statement. It's not just that it was so painful. Oh, you're dying on the cross. But as you walk along the cross, you go, oh, so shameful. Oh, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at that. Or you have your kids like that. You see, if, you, if you're naughty, you end up there. So be good. See, the cross was a public statement. Don't do what this guy did. It was shameful. And you know, it wasn't just that it was so painful, but it was like, if you were on the cross, you would say to people, don't look at me. You know, I'm so embarrassed. This is so horrible. And that's what they did to Jesus. He was just a thing. He wasn't a person. You know, he, he doesn't need his clothes. I'll take his clothes. But God is saying, this person whom you're humiliating, whom you're rejecting, is my king. Verse, again, the, the second half of verse 24, this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for them, and cast lots for them. By the way, if you look on your footnotes, this is actually a quotation from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, look at it later, was written 1,000 years before this, exactly 1,000 years before this, by a guy named King David. And if you know nothing about Psalm 22, just read the first verse, which, we, which reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who says this? Who says this? Jesus says this on the cross. But no, King David wrote this 1,000 years ago. And he also wrote this verse. They divided my garments and cast lots for me. In other words, God had planned this cross 1,000 years before. Actually, no, God had planned this whole events of the cross, of him being rejected, dying, and being even having his clothes taken from him 
before you even existed from the beginning of time. What this is saying, friends, is not just that Pilate did this for Jesus, or that the religious teachers did this for Jesus, or even that the soldiers did this for Jesus. Friends, what this is saying is God. God did this for Jesus. It was God's plan for Jesus to be in this place, in this moment, on the cross. And all these people who seem to be in control, God made them do those things. You know, the next time that you sin, the next time you do something, you think, oh, you know, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this thing. Don't think that God isn't in control, even of your actions. Don't think that God doesn't even care about what you're doing. God is such a God that He is in control, not just when things go very well, sunshine today, but even especially when things go very bad, even especially when evil people seem to get away with evil things. The Bible reminds us at the cross, God was behind every single action. That's the first thing we see, the first section. We see people taking from Jesus, taking from Jesus. But behind that, a God who is working to exalt his son, Jesus. Jesus does not say a single word in this whole section. Notice that. But everyone is talking. Pilate talks. The religious people talks. Even the soldiers talk. Let's not tear it. But behind every one of those speech is the fulfillment of God to bring God to, to bring his son to the point of exaltation and glory. This is my son. This is the king. You imagine now you're voting for this king. They reject him. Check. They humiliate him. Check. God puts one on a box. Check. He is your king. The king whom you reject, whom you don't want, whom you think is beneath you, is the king whom I've exalted on the cross. So that's the first thing we see so far. The taking, but also God's plan. Second half, we're going to look at Jesus. How does Jesus respond to all this hubris and this might and this power? Well, Jesus responds in love. Jesus gives his life. And we see this first with his mother and with his disciple. Verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, I won't ask you to put up your thumbs up, but I want you to think in your hearts, you know, have you ever been at, with someone when they are just about to die? Have you ever been there with someone in their last moments before death? Here were these women, you know, his mom, but also his auntie, you know, the, 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 his Mary's sister, and also all these women. Where are the guys? They all run away. <laughs> but here are people who want to be with him because they can see it's his last moments of life. But actually what we see is here Jesus being there for his mother. Verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took his mother home. You know, the kind of like, here is your mother, here is your son. By the way, it should make you think of, um, yeah, you sketch it up. You know, if you go, if you, you know, Jesus saying, here's your mother, here's your son. It's almost, almost like, you know, at a wedding, you know, almost like when the husband of the, uh, when the father of the bride said, here is your wife. Or it's like, here is your husband, and then pronounces you husband and wife. Jesus is pronouncing you mother, brother, sister. It's almost like Jesus is saying to you now, you know, you, you think you logged on today on your own will. Oh, I want to come in and hear a sermon. I want to sing some songs. But Jesus is almost saying, Here's your brother in Christ. Here's your sister in Christ. Jesus is giving you to one another to love them as if he loves them. Now, the person next to you might be your wife, might be your father, might be your son, might be your mother. But there's this extra layer. Jesus says, love them, not just as you know, your brother or sister, love them as I love them. Love them with the love of of Christ. Meaning, you know, Christians who hear this and become even more loving. You know, every week I, I see this lady, you know, she's an old folks home. She can't even get up herself. She can't even feed herself. And this week she said, she asked me to buy a birthday card. <laughs> 
for one of her carers. And I bought her this birthday card. She went, oh, wow, so nice. It was very cheap. It was just from Sainsbury's. But it was very nice because she wanted to give it to a carer for her birthday. Because why? You can tell. You can tell who it is who is caring for you out of genuine love, out of genuine responsibility and genuine trust. This person has been given me in my life by Jesus to love and to care. It's one of the reasons why you know, Christian families, Christian marriages have that extra layer of you know, faithfulness because you're not just being faithful to one another. When you love one another, you're being faithful to God. What was the one last few words that Jesus said in, the, in, in his discussion with, with his disciples in the last few weeks? Love one another as I have loved you. It's almost like a will. You know, when someone leaves behind a will and he says, I leave all my money to my dog. Oh, you, oh, you don't get any money. <laughs> we sometimes happen. This is Jesus' will. I leave you one another. Love one another. Show that love. So that's the first thing, the first half of what Jesus says on the cross as he's about to lose his life. He's thinking of his mother's livelihood. But finally, he talk, thinks about us. And this is you and me now here that Jesus is thinking about when he says this, verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed or fulfilled, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. That, that's very weird, by the way. You know, by the way, I said earlier, if you've ever been with someone who is about to die, you know, the earlier months, uh, maybe you might have a good time, you have a lot of things to talk about. But in truth, for most of us, in those final few moments, you know, the truth is, most people don't have any energy to say anything. You know, it's often in silence, and it's often in sadness. Jesus, by the way, is hung on the cross. And the thing to know about the cross is that people die through something called asphyxiation. They don't die because of their nails or because of bleeding. They actually die because if you try to do pull-ups, have you go to, go to this exercise where you try to pull yourself up, and even if you raise your arms up, you try to breathe in, it's quite hard to breathe. You have to go like, it's a lot easier to breathe like this. But when you're like this, your, your chest is actually being pressed apart and you can't actually expand your chest to breathe. And I say this because when Jesus says these words, he has to go, I am thirsty. Every word he says here right at the end is so painful and so important. He's not just saying this because he's thirsty, by the way. But there's something significant there. What is that significance? Well, you know, some people have connected this to certain psalms, and there, is, there are some psalms, Psalm 22 as well, you know, my, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Psalm 69 verse 21 is another good, good one. You know, my enemies gave me, you know, gal, you know, gave me sour wine, and that fulfills this as well. But actually, the interesting thing is, you know, within John's gospel itself, that word thirst has an interesting connotation. Because if you remember, there's an incident where Jesus is in a hot sun talking to a woman, by a well, and he makes her this offer. This, she's always trying to sell, him some, sell her something. He says, everyone who drinks this water that I give them will never be thirsty again. Now that's quite an amazing claim. And now he says, I am thirsty. It's almost like someone saying, I'm going to sell you this amazing car that, you know, like think of a Tesla or Mercedes Benz. And then you look at the person, the car that the person is driving is some Morris Minor or just riding a bicycle. So, how can you sell me this amazing car by you yourself by driving a bicycle? Or Jesus saying, how can you give me this amazing water that I won't thirst, but you are thirsty? Or even more seriously than that, how can you offer me this eternal life when you are about to die? And you see here, when Jesus is talking about thirst, Jesus is talking about death. He's talking about death. It's interesting that these last few verses where Jesus is about to die, there is not a single description of blood. You notice that? If you watch like movies like The Passion of the Christ, later on, by the way, verse 35, yes, there's some blood there. But all the gore that you see in movies, when you see The Passion of the Christ, you know that Jesus is covered in head to toe with blood, and that's true. He is in agony, but that's not described here in the Bible. Instead, the word thirst is described to describe what he's going through. Meaning Jesus is not just describing that end point at the end of life when you 
die, you fall off a cliff, you lift, 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 and then you die. But you know, maybe even now, as I'm speaking, I, I feel a bit thirsty. I feel like taking a drink of water. Or maybe you feel a bit tired. You know, uh, it's 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 just so tiring. You know, just going through this lockdown. Or maybe even sometimes that frustration. Or maybe even aging. You know, those creaking in your back. Friends, do you realize that all the things I've been describing is actually death in life? It's that element of life which has been tarnished, that has been frustrated by death, that reminds us that there is a final death. That what you you no matter how healthy, how good, how sunshine, how happy you are, it's imperfect. It's spoiled by this thing called sin and death. And when Jesus says, "I thirst." Jesus is saying, "I am taking that death on me." See, Jesus is about to give you that water that will fill you that you won't thirst. But the way that He does that, He has to take away something from you. He has to take your sin, your death, your thirst. And when He does that, notice verse uh, verse thirty. When He had finished receiving that drink, Jesus said, "It is finished. It is done." Meaning, there is nothing else that Jesus needs to do beyond this, to take away your death, and to give you eternal life. And with that, he bowed his head, and the word there is, gave up his spirit. It's actually the exact same word as verse sixteen. If you go back to verse sixteen, the soldier, uh, verse sixteen, Pilate handed him over, gave Jesus over. So, by uh, Jesus, Pilate gave Jesus over to the cross. Verse thirty. Jesus gave over his spirit to his Father, meaning Jesus, from beginning to end, is being handed over, handed over, handed over until he receives. He's being received by his Father. This is submission. This is this is obedience to the Father's plan until completion. It is finished. Takers and givers. You know. Let let me just put it this way. Uh, in your own hearts, what kind of Person, are you? Are you a taker, or are you a giver? Let's be honest. You know, lots of us Chinese, <laughs> at a buffet, with all the food there, and with like two-hour limit, we are takers. Eat as much as you can because <laughs> there's not so much. I need to eat as much as we can, and we say, oh, you know, that's just a buffet, you know. But you know, we do that at work. Make as much money as you can. We do that sometimes even in relationships. Love me as much as you can. Pay attention. Why aren't you listening? Why is she talking to me? Why aren't you? Res- we do that even sometimes at church. You better respect me, man. You know, I, I give so much to this church. You better respect me. And sometimes we go through life with this big I O U statement. You know, I have given so much. This world owes me respect. I have been through much. God owes me happiness. And we keep reminding the people around us. You need to show me the thing that you owe me. And the thing is, you can feel pretty full, living life that way, but everyone around you just kind of dries up. You know, they wither away, and you wonder why? Why are they so tired? Why? 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 It's because you are just taking and taking and taking, but at the same time, you're never full. You know, Pilate does he look happy? The religious leaders, you know, these soldiers who are you know scrounging over scraps. Do they? They no. It just makes you more frustrated. More conscious of the things that are owed to you. On the flip side, you know, if you if you thought, oh, I'm a giver, and you know, many I I know that the fact is many of you are, you know, you give and give your time, your money, your effort to your kids, your attention to the people around you at work. You really you really try really really very very hard, and everyone else is full, but you are dry. <laughs> Sometimes you feel come to the end of the day and you think, I just I just don't have anything else to give. You know, I I I I can't keep doing it this way. I I can't keep going on and this track. You know, God. You know, why have you put me in this situation? And here, the thing is, Christians are not defined by their giving either. You know, earlier on, you know, giving the money just because you give money doesn't make you a Christian. But at the cross, we see what it means. It's not our giving, but God's giving. It's not our taking, but our receiving with thankfulness <laughs> what God has given to us on the cross. That makes it. the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen. Tell me, God so loved the world that He gave, He gave His one and only Son. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, what makes you a Christian? If you're not a Christian here today, 
what makes you a Christian if you are a Christian here today and still walking with Christ is the fact that we receive with thankfulness something that we could never give, we could never do for anyone, even for ourselves. We receive it from Jesus Christ on the cross, that eternal life, you know, that forgiveness, that fullness. And He takes from us all that sin, all that dryness, all that hidden, hidden angst inside of us. And He gives us just nothing left except His love and His acceptance. Friends, I hope you hear this and you go, you know, Jesus, this is what I need. This is the, I'm following you. This is the destination where I want to be. Lord, please, please, I, let, let me receive this gift. Let me trust in you for this life. Let me look to you when I sin and see there my Savior, my God. Yeah? Why don't we pray? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that at the cross, you know, we can lay all our burdens, all our sins. And we can receive, yes, life, yes, blessing, but we can receive Jesus. We receive him. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will see him face to face again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.